Introduction to Smoke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. Translated by Constance Garnett. Introduction Smoke was first published in 1867, several years after Turgenev had fixed his home in Baden with his friends the Viarots. Baden at this date was a favourite resort for all circles of Russian society, and Turgenev was able to study at his leisure his countrymen as they appeared to foreign critical eyes. The novel is therefore the most cosmopolitan of all Turgenev's works. On a veiled background of the great world of European society, little groups of representative Russians, members of the aristocratic and the young Russia parties, are etched with an incisive, unfaltering hand. Smoke, as an historical study, though it yields in importance to fathers and children and virgin soil, is of great significance to Russians. It might, with truth, have been named transition, for the generation it paints was then midway between the early philosophical nihilism of the sixties and the active political nihilism of the seventies. Markedly transitional, however, as was the Russian mind of the days of smoke, Turgenev, with the faculty that distinguishes the great artist from the artist of second rank, the faculty of seeking out and stamping the essential under-confused and fleeting forms, has once and forever laid bare the fundamental weakness of the Slav nature, its weakness of will. Smoke is an attack, a deserved attack, not merely on the young Russia party, but on all the parties, not on the old ideas or the new ideas, but on the proneness of the Slav nature to fall prey to a consuming weakness, a moral stagnation, a feverish ennui the Slav nature that analyzes everything with force and brilliancy, and ends so often by doing nothing. Smoke is the attack, bitter yet sympathetic, of a man who, with growing despair, has watched the weakness of his countrymen, while he loves his country all the more for the bitterness their sins have brought upon it. Smoke is the scourging of a babbling generation, by a man who, grown sick to death of the chatter of reformers and reactionists, is visiting the sins of the fathers on the children, with a contempt out of patience for the hereditary vice in the Slav blood. And this time the author cannot be accused of partisanship by any blunderer. A plague on both your houses, is his message, equally to the bureaucrats and the revolutionists and so skilfully does he wield the thong that every lash falls on the back of both parties. An exquisite piece of political satire is smoke, for this reason alone it would stand unique among novels. The success of smoke was immediate and great, but the hue and cry that assailed it was even greater. The publication of the book marks the final rupture between Turgenev and the party of young Russia. The younger generation never forgave him for drawing Gubaryov and Bombayev, Voroshilov and Madame Suhanchikov, types, indeed, in which all revolutionary or unorthodox parties are painfully rich. Or, perhaps, Turgenev was forgiven for it when he was in his grave, a spot where forgiveness flowers to a late perfection. And yet the fault was not Turgenev's. No, his last novel, Virgin Soil, bears splendid witness that it was young Russia that was one-eyed. Let the plain truth here be set down. Smoke is not a complete picture of the young Russia of the day. It was not yet time for that picture. And that being so, Turgenev did the next best thing in attacking the windbags, the charlatans, and their crowd of shallow, chattering followers, as well as the empty formulas of the laissez-faire party. It was inevitable that the attack should bring on him the anger of all young enthusiasts working for the cause. It was inevitable that the cause of reform in Russia should be mixed up with the Gubardiovs, just as reforms in France a few years ago were mixed up with Boulanger, 
and that Turgenev's waning popularity for the last twenty years of his life should be directly caused by his honesty and clear-sightedness in regard to Russian liberalism was inevitable also. To be crucified by those you have benefited is the cross of honour of all great single-hearted men. But though the bitterness of political life flavours smoke, although its points of departure and arrival are wrapped in the atmosphere of Russia's dark and insoluble problems, nevertheless the two central figures of the book, Litvinov and Irina, are not political figures. Luckily for them, in Gurbardyov's words, they belong to the underdeveloped. Litvinov himself may be dismissed in a sentence. He is Turgenev's favourite type of man, a character much akin to his own nature, gentle, deep, and sympathetic. Turgenev often drew such a character. Lavretsky, for example, in A House of Gentlefolk, is a first cousin to Litvinov, an older and a sadder man. But Irina! Irina is unique for Turgenev has in her perfected her type till she reaches a destroying witchery of fascination and subtlety. Irina will stand for ever in the long gallery of great creations, smiling with that enigmatic smile which took from Litvinov in a glance half his life and his love for Tatyana. The special triumph of her creation is that she combines that exact balance between good and evil which makes good women seem insipid beside her and bad women unnatural. And by nature irresistible, she is made doubly so to the imagination by the situation which she recreates between Litvinov and herself. She ardently desires to become nobler to possess all that the ideal of love means for the heart of woman, but she has only the power given to her of enervating the man she loves. Can she become a Tatyana to him? No, to no man. She is born to corrupt, yet never to be corrupted. She rises mistress of herself after the first measure of fatal delight. And, never giving her whole heart absolutely to her lover, she nevertheless remains ever to be desired. Further, her wit, her scorn, her beauty, preserve her from all the influences of evil she does not deliberately employ. Such a woman is as old and as rare a type as Helen of Troy. It is most often found among the great mistresses of princes, and it was from a mistress of Alexander the Second that Turgenev modelled Irina. Of the minor characters, Tatyana is an astonishing instance of Turgenev's skill in drawing a complete character with half a dozen strokes of the pen. The reader seems to have known her intimately all his life, her family life, her girlhood, her goodness and individual ways to the smallest detail. Yet she only speaks on two or three occasions. Potugin is but a weary shadow of Litvinov but it is difficult to say how much this is a telling refinement of art. The shadow of this prematurely exhausted man is cast beforehand by Irina across Litvinov's future. For Turgenev to have drawn Potugin as an ordinary individual would have vulgarized the novel and robbed it of its skilful proportions, for Potugin is one of those shadowy figures which supply the chiaroscuro to a brilliant etching. As a triumphant example of consummate technical skill, smoke will repay the most exact scrutiny. There are a lightness and a grace about the novel that conceal its actual strength. The political argument glides with such ease, in and out of the love story, that the hostile critic is absolutely baffled, and while the most intricate steps are executed in the face of a crowd of angry enemies, the performer lands smiling and in safety. The art by which Irina's disastrous fascination results in falsity, and Litvinov's desperate striving after sincerity ends in rehabilitation, the art by which these two threads are spun, till their meaning colours the faint political message of the book, is so delicate that, like the silken webs which gleam only for the first fresh hours in the forest, it leaves no trace, but becomes a dream in the memory. And yet this book, which has the freshness of windy rain and the whirling of autumn leaves, is a story of ignominious weakness, 
of the passion that kills that degrades that renders life despicable as turgenev himself says smoke is the finest example in literature of a subjective psychological study of passion rendered clearly and objectively in terms of french art its character we will not say its superiority lies in the extraordinary clearness with which the most obscure mental phenomena are analysed in relation to the ordinary values of daily life. At the precise point of psychological analysis, where Tolstoy wanders and does not convince the reader, and at the precise point where Dostoevsky's analysis seems exaggerated and obscure, like a figure looming through the mist, Turgenev throws a ray of light from the outer to the inner world of man and the two worlds are revealed in the natural depths of their connection. It is in fact difficult to find among the great modern artists men whose natural balance of intellect can be said to equalize their special genius. The Greeks alone present to the world a spectacle of a triumphant harmony in the critical and creative mind of man, and this is their great preeminence. But smoke presents the curious feature of a novel, slav in virtue of its modern psychological genius which is classical in its treatment and expression throughout the balance of turgenev's intellect reigns ever supreme over the natural morbidity of his subject and thus smoke in every sense of the word is a classic for all time edward garnett january eighteen ninety six end of introduction Chapter One of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One. On the tenth of August, eighteen sixty two, at four o'clock in the afternoon, a great number of people were thronging before the well known Conversation in Baden Baden. The weather was lovely everything around the green trees the bright houses of the gay city and the undulating outline of the mountains everything was in holiday mood basking in the rays of the kindly sunshine everything seemed smiling with a sort of blind confiding delight and the same glad vague smile strayed over the human faces too old and young ugly and beautiful alike even the blackened and whitened visages of the Parisian demi-monde could not destroy the general impression of bright content and elation, while their many-coloured ribbons and feathers, and the sparks of gold and steel on their hats and veils, involuntarily recalled the intensified brilliance and light fluttering of birds in spring, with their rainbow-tinted wings but the dry guttural snapping of the french jargon heard on all sides could not equal the song of birds nor be compared with it everything however was going on in its accustomed way the orchestra in the pavilion played first a medley from the traviata then one of strauss's waltzes then tell her a russian song adapted for instruments by an obliging conductor in the gambling saloons round the green tables crowded the same familiar figures with the same dull greedy half stupefied half exasperated wholly rapacious expression which the gambling fever lends to all even the most aristocratic features the same well-fed and ultra-fashionably dressed russian landowner from tambov with wide staring eyes leaned over the table and with uncomprehending haste heedless of the cold smiles of the croupiers themselves at the very instant of the cry rien ne va plus laid with perspiring hand golden rings of louis d'or on all the four corners of the roulette depriving himself by so doing of every possibility of gaining anything even in case of success this did not in the least prevent him the same evening from affirming the contrary with disinterested indignation to prince coco one of the well-known leaders of the aristocratic opposition the prince coco who in paris at the salon of the princess matilda so happily remarked in the presence of the emperor madame le principe de la propriété est profondément ébranlé en russie at the russian tree à l'arbre russe 
our dear fellow countrymen and countrywomen were assembled after their wont they approached haughtily and carelessly in fashionable style greeted each other with dignity and elegant ease as befits beings who find themselves at the topmost pinnacle of contemporary culture but when they had met and sat down together they were absolutely at a loss for anything to say to one another and had to be content with a pitiful interchange of inanities or with the exceedingly indecent and exceedingly insipid old jokes of a hopelessly stale french wit once a journalist a chattering buffoon with jewish shoes on his paltry little legs and a contemptible little beard on his mean little visage he retailed to them assez pense ou say all the sweet absurdities from the old comic almanacs charivari and tintamare and they assez pense ou say, burst into grateful laughter as though forced in spite of themselves to recognize the crushing superiority of foreign wit and their hopeless incapacity to invent anything amusing yet here were almost all the fine fleur of our society all the high life and mirrors of fashion here was count x our incomparable dilettante a profoundly musical nature who so divinely recites songs on the piano but cannot in fact take two notes correctly without fumbling at random on the keys and sings in a style something between that of a poor gypsy singer and a parisian hairdresser here was our enchanting baron q a master in every line literature administration oratory and card sharping here too was prince y the friend of religion and the people who in the blissful epoch when the spirit trade was a monopoly had made himself betimes a huge fortune by the sale of vodka adulterated with belladonna and the brilliant general o o who had achieved the subjugation of something and the pacification of something else and who is nevertheless still a nonentity and does not know what to do with himself and r r the amusing fat man who regards himself as a great invalid and a great wit though he is in fact as strong as a bull and as dull as a post this r is almost the only man in our day who has preserved the traditions of the dandies of the forties of the epoch of the hero of our times and the countess vorotinsky he has preserved too the special gait with the swing on the heels and la cure de la pose it cannot even be put into words in russian the unnatural deliberation of movement the sleepy dignity of expression the immovable offended-looking countenance and the habit of interrupting other people's remarks with a yawn gazing at his own finger-nails laughing through his nose suddenly shifting his hat from the back of his head on to his eyebrows etc here too were people in government circles diplomats bigwigs with european names men of wisdom and intellect who imagined that the golden bull was an edict of the pope and that the english poor tax is a tax levied on the poor and here too were the hot-blooded though tongue-tied devotees of the damo camilla young society dandies with superb partings down the back of their heads and splendid drooping whiskers dressed in real london costumes young bucks whom one would fancy there was nothing to hinder from becoming as vulgar as the illustrious french wit above mentioned but no our home products are not in fashion it seems and countess s the celebrated arbitress of fashion and grand genre by spiteful tongues nicknamed queen of the wasps and medusa in a mob cap prefers in the absence of the french wit to consort with the italians moldavians american spiritualists smart secretaries of foreign embassies and germans of effeminate but prematurely circumspect physiognomy of whom the place is full the example of the countess is followed by the princess babette she in whose arms chopin died the ladies in europe in whose arms he expired are to be reckoned by thousands and the princess annette who would have been perfectly captivating if the simple village washerwoman had not suddenly peeped out in her at times like a smell of cabbage wafted across the most delicate perfume and princess pachette 
to whom the following mischance had occurred. Her husband had fallen into a good berth, and all at once, Dieu sait pourquoi, he had thrashed the provost and stolen twenty thousand roubles of public money. And the laughing Princess Zizi, and the tearful Princess Zozo, they all left their compatriots on one side, and were merciless in their treatment of them. Let us, too, leave them on one side, these charming ladies, and walk away from the renowned tree near which they sit in such costly but somewhat tasteless costumes, and God grant them relief from the boredom consuming them. End of chapter 1 Chapter Two of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. A few paces from the Russian tree, at a little table in front of Weber's coffee house, there was sitting a good-looking man about thirty, of medium height, thin and dark, with a manly and pleasant face. He sat bending forward, with both arms leaning on his stick with the calm and simple air of a man to whom the idea had not occurred that any one would notice him or pay any attention to him. His large expressive golden-brown eyes were gazing deliberately about him, sometimes screwed up to keep the sunshine out of them, and then watching fixedly some eccentric figure that passed by him while a childlike smile faintly stirred his fine moustache and lips, and his prominent short chin. He wore a roomy coat of German cut, and a soft grey hat hid half of his high forehead. At the first glance he made the impression of an honest, sensible, rather confident young man, such as there are many in the world. He seemed to be resting from prolonged labours, and to be deriving all the more simple-minded amusement from the scene spread out before him, because his thoughts were far away, and because they moved, too, those thoughts, in a world utterly unlike that which surrounded him at the moment. He was a Russian. His name was Grigory Mikhailovich Litvinov. We have to make his acquaintance, and so it will be well to relate in a few words his past, which presents little of much interest or complexity. He was the son of an honest retired official of plebeian extraction, but he was educated, not as one would naturally expect, in the town, but in the country. His mother was of noble family, and had been educated in a government school. She was a good-natured and very enthusiastic creature, not devoid of character, however. Though she was twenty years younger than her husband, she remodelled him, as far as she could, drew him out of the petty official groove into the landowner's way of life, and softened and refined his harsh and stubborn character. Thanks to her, he began to dress with neatness, and to behave with decorum. He came to respect learned men and learning, though, of course, he never took a single book in his hand. He gave up swearing, and tried in every way not to demean himself. He even arrived at walking more quietly, and speaking in a subdued voice, mostly of elevated subjects, which cost him no small effort. Ah! they ought to be flogged, and that's all about it, he sometimes thought to himself, but aloud he pronounced, Yes, yes, that's so, of course. It is a great question. Litvinov's mother set her household, too, upon a European footing. She addressed the servants by the plural you, instead of the familiar thou, and never allowed any one to gorge himself into a state of lethargy at her table. As regards the property belonging to her, neither she nor her husband was capable of looking after it at all. It had been long allowed to run to waste, but there was plenty of land, with all sorts of useful appurtenances, forest lands and a lake, on which there had once stood a factory, which had been founded by a zealous but unsystematic owner, and had flourished in the hands of a scoundrelly merchant, and gone utterly to ruin under the superintendence of a conscientious German manager. Madame Litvinov was contented so long as she did not dissipate her fortune or contract debts. Unluckily, she could not boast of good health, and she died of consumption in the very year that her son entered the Moscow University. He did not complete his course there, owing to circumstances of which the reader will hear more later on 
and went back to his provincial home, where he idled away some time, without work and without ties, almost without acquaintances. Thanks to the disinclination for active service of the local gentry, who were, however, not so much penetrated by the Western theory of the evils of absenteeism, as by the home-grown conviction that one's own shirt is the nearest to one's skin. He was drawn for military service in 1855, and almost died of typhus in the Crimea, where he spent six months in a mud hut on the shore of the putrid sea, without ever seeing a single ally. After that, he served, not of course without unpleasant experiences, on the councils of the nobility, and, after being a little time in the country, acquired a passion for farming. He realized that his mother's property, under the indolent and feeble management of his infirm old father, did not yield a tenth of the revenue it might yield, and that, in experienced and skilful hands, it might be converted into a perfect gold mine. But he realized, too, that experience and skill were just what he lacked, and he went abroad to study agriculture and technology, to learn them from the first rudiments. More than four years he had spent in Mecklenburg, in Silesia, and in Karlsruhe, and he had travelled in Belgium and in England. He had worked conscientiously and accumulated information. He had not acquired it easily, but he had persevered through his difficulties to the end, and now with confidence in himself, in his future, and in his usefulness to his neighbours, perhaps even to the whole countryside, he was preparing to return home, where he was summoned with despairing prayers and entreaties in every letter from his father, now completely bewildered by the emancipation, the redivision of lands, and the terms of redemption, by the new regime, in short. But why was he in Baden? Well, he was in Baden because he was from day to day expecting the arrival there of his cousin and betrothed, Tatyana Petrovna Shestov. He had known her almost from childhood, and had spent the spring and summer with her at Dresden, where she was living with her aunt. He felt sincere love and profound respect for his young kinswoman, and on the conclusion of his dull preparatory labours, when he was preparing to enter on a new field, to begin real, unofficial duties, he proposed to her as a woman dearly loved, a comrade and a friend, to unite her life with his, for happiness and for sorrow, for labour and for rest, for better, for worse, as the English say. She had consented, and he had returned to Karlsruhe, where his books, papers and properties had been left. But why was he at Baden, you ask again? Well, he was at Baden because Tatyana's aunt, who had brought her up, Kapitolina Markovna Shestov, an old unmarried lady of fifty-five, a most good-natured, honest, eccentric soul, a free thinker, all aglow with the fire of self-sacrifice and abnegation, an esprit fort, she read Strauss, it is true she concealed the fact from her niece, and a democrat, sworn opponent of aristocracy and fashionable society, could not resist the temptation of gazing, for once, on this aristocratic society in such a fashionable place as Baden. Kapitolina Markovna wore no crinoline, and had her white hair cut in a round crop, but luxury and splendour had a secret fascination for her, and it was her favourite pastime to rail at them and express her contempt of them. How could one refuse to gratify the good old lady? But Litvinov was so quiet and simple, he gazed so self-confidently about him, because his life lay so clearly mapped out before him, because his career was defined, and because he was proud of this career, and rejoiced in it as the work of his own hands. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Hello, hello, here he is! He suddenly heard a squeaky voice just above his ear, and a plump hand slapped him on the shoulder. He lifted his head, and perceived one of his few Moscow acquaintances, a certain Bombeyev, a good-natured but good-for-nothing fellow. He was no longer young, 
he had a flabby nose and soft cheeks that looked as if they had been boiled dishevelled greasy locks and a fat squat person everlastingly short of cash and everlastingly in raptures over something rostislav bambaev wandered aimless but exclamatory over the face of our long-suffering mother earth well this is something like a meeting he repeated opening wide his sunken eyes and drawing down his thick lips over which the straggling dyed moustaches seemed strangely out of place ah baden all the world runs here like black beetles how did you come here grisha there was positively no one in the world bambaev did not address by his christian name i came here three days ago from where why do you ask why indeed but stop stop a minute grisha you are perhaps not aware who has just arrived here gurbayov himself in person that's who's here he came yesterday from heidelberg you know him of course i have heard of him is that all upon my word at once this very minute we will haul you along to him not know a man like that and by the way here's boroshilov stop a minute grisha perhaps you don't know him either i have the honour to present you to one another both learned men he's a phoenix indeed kiss each other and uttering these words bambaev turned to a good-looking young man standing near him with a fresh and rosy but prematurely demure face litvinov got up and it need hardly be said did not kiss him but exchanged a cursory bow with the phoenix who to judge from the severity of his demeanour was not over pleased at this unexpected introduction i said a phoenix and i will not go back on my word continued bambaev go to petersburg to the military school and look at the golden board whose name stands first there the name of voroshilov semyon yakolevitch but gubayov gubayov my dear fellow it's to him we must fly i absolutely worship that man and i'm not alone everyone's at his feet ah what a work he is writing oh ho oh, oh. what is his work about inquired litvinov about everything my dear boy after the style of Bukla, you know but more profound more profound everything will be solved and made clear in it and have you read his work yourself no i have not read it and indeed it's a secret which must not be spread about but from gorbayov one may expect everything everything yes bambayev sighed and clasped his hands ah if we had two or three intellects like that growing up in russia ah what mightn't we see then my god i tell you one thing grisha whatever pursuit you may have been engaged in these latter days and i don't even know what your pursuits are in general whatever your convictions may be i don't know them either from him, Gurbayov, you will find something to learn. Unluckily, he is not here for long. We must make the most of him. We must go. To him! To him! A passing dandy with reddish curls and a blue ribbon on his low hat turned round and stared through his eyeglass with a sarcastic smile at Bambaev. Litvinov felt irritated. "'What are you shouting for?' he said. "'One would think you were hallooing dogs on at a hunt.' I have not had dinner yet. Well, think of that. We can go at once to Weber's, the three of us. Capital! You have the cash to pay for me? He added in an undertone. Yes, yes, only I really don't know. Leave off, please. You will thank me for it, and he will be delighted. Ah, heavens! Bombayev interrupted himself. It's the finale from Ernane they're playing. How delicious! Assom, mo carlo what a fellow i am though in tears in a minute well semyon yakolevitch voroshilov shall we go eh voroshilov who had remained all the while standing with immovable propriety still maintaining his former haughty dignity of demeanour dropped his eyes expressively frowned and muttered something between his teeth but he did not refuse and litvinov thought well, we may as well do it, as I've plenty of time on my hands. Bombayev took his arm, but before turning towards the café, he beckoned to Isabel, the renowned flower-girl of the jockey-club. 
he had conceived the idea of buying a bunch of flowers of her but the aristocratic flower girl did not stir and indeed what should induce her to approach a gentleman without gloves in a soiled fustian jacket streaky cravat and boots trodden down at heel whom she had not even seen in paris then Voroshilov, in his turn beckoned to her to him she responded and he taking a tiny bunch of violets from her basket flung her a florin he thought to astonish her by his munificence but not an eyelash on her face quivered and when he had turned away she pursed up her mouth contemptuously Voroshilov was dressed very fashionably even exquisitely but the experienced eye of the parisian girl noted at once in his get-up and in his bearing in his very walk which showed traces of premature military drill the absence of genuine pure-blooded chic when they had taken their seats in the principal dining hall at weber's and ordered dinner our friends fell into conversation bombayev discoursed loudly and hotly upon the immense importance of gubaryov but soon he ceased speaking and gasping and chewing noisily drained off glass after glass voroshilov ate and drank little and as it were reluctantly and after questioning litvinov as to the nature of his interests fell to giving expression to his own opinions not so much on those interests as on questions of various kinds in general all at once he warmed up and set off at a gallop like a spirited horse boldly and decisively assigning to every syllable every letter its due weight like a confident cadet going up for his final examination with vehement but inappropriate gestures at every instant since no one interrupted him he became more eloquent more emphatic it seemed as though he were reading a dissertation or lecture the names of the most recent scientific authorities with the addition of the dates of the birth or death of each of them the titles of pamphlets that had only just appeared and names 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 fell in showers together from his tongue affording himself intense satisfaction reflected in his glowing eyes voroshilov seemingly despised everything old and attached value only to the cream of culture the latest most advanced points of science to mention however inappropriately a book of some dr zarbengel on pennsylvanian prisons or yesterday's articles in the asiatic journal on the vedas and puranas he pronounced it journal in the english fashion though he certainly did not know english was for him a real joy a felicity litvinov listened and listened to him and could not make out what could be his special line at one moment his talk was of the part played by the celtic race in history then he was carried away to the ancient world and discoursed upon the aegenetan marbles harangued with great warmth on the sculptor living earlier than phidias onatus who was however transformed by him into jonathan which lent his whole discourse a half biblical half american flavour then he suddenly bounded away to political economy and called bastiat a fool or a blockhead as bad as adam smith and all the physiocrats physiocrats murmured bombayev after him aristocrats among other things voroshilov called forth an expression of bewilderment on bombayev's face by a criticism dropped casually in passing of macaulay as an old-fashioned writer superseded by modern historical science as for Nist, he declared he need scarcely refer to him and he shrugged his shoulders bombayev shrugged his shoulders too and all this at once without any inducement before strangers in a cafe litvinov reflected looking at the fair hair clear eyes and white teeth of his new acquaintance he was specially embarrassed by those large sugar-white teeth and those hands with their inappropriate gesticulations and he doesn't once smile and with it all he would seem to be a nice lad and absolutely inexperienced voroshilov began to calm down at last his voice youthfully resonant and shrill as a young cock's broke a little bombayev seized the opportunity to declaim verses and again nearly burst into tears which scandalized one table near them round which was seated an english family and set another tittering 
two parisian cocottes were dining at this second table with a creature who resembled an ancient baby in a wig the waiter brought the bill the friends paid it well cried bambeyev getting heavily up from his chair now for a cup of coffee and quick march there she is our russia he added stopping in the doorway and pointing almost rapturously with his soft red hand to voroshilov and litvinov what do you think of her russia indeed thought litvinov and voroshilov whose face had by now regained its concentrated expression again smiled condescendingly and gave a little tap with his heels within five minutes they were all three mounting the stairs of the hotel where stepan nikolaitch gubaryov was staying a tall slender lady in a hat with a short black veil was coming quickly down the same staircase catching sight of litvinov she turned suddenly round to him and stopped still as though struck by amazement her face flushed instantaneously and then as quickly grew pale under its thick lace veil but litvinov did not observe her and the lady ran down the wide steps more quickly than before End of chapter three chapter four of smoke by ivan turgenev this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four grigory litvinov a brick a true russian heart i commend him to you cried bambeyev conducting litvinov up to a short man of the figure of a country gentleman with an unbuttoned collar in a short jacket grey morning trousers and slippers standing in the middle of a light and very well furnished room and this he added addressing himself to litvinov is he the man himself do you understand gubaryov then in a word litvinov stared with curiosity at the man himself he did not at first sight find in him anything out of the common he saw before him a gentleman of respectable somewhat dull exterior with a broad forehead large eyes full lips a big beard and a thick neck with a fixed gaze bent sidelong and downwards this gentleman simpered and said hm ah very pleased raised his hand to his own face and at once turned his back on litvinov took a few paces upon the carpet with a slow and peculiar shuffle as though he were trying to slink along unseen Gubaryov had the habit of continually walking up and down, and constantly plucking and combing his beard with the tips of his long, hard nails. Besides Gubaryov, there was also in the room a lady of about fifty, in a shabby silk dress, with an excessively mobile face, almost as yellow as a lemon, a little black moustache on her upper lip, and eyes which moved so quickly that they seemed as though they were jumping out of her head there was too a broad-shouldered man sitting bent up in a corner well honoured matrona semyonovna began gurbayov turning to the lady and apparently not considering it necessary to introduce litvinov to her what was it you were beginning to tell us the lady her name was matrona semyonovna suhanchikov she was a widow childless and not rich and had been travelling from country to country for two years past began with peculiar exasperated vehemence well so he appears before the prince and says to him your excellency he says in such an office in such a position as yours what will it cost you to alleviate my lot you he says cannot but respect the purity of my ideas and is it possible he says in these days to persecute a man for his ideas and what do you suppose the prince did that cultivated dignitary in that exalted position why what did he do observed gubaryov lighting a cigarette with a meditative air the lady drew herself up and held out her bony right hand with the first finger separated from the rest he called his groom and said to him take off that man's coat at once and keep it yourself i make you a present of that coat and did the groom take it asked bambeyev 
throwing up his arms. He took it and kept it, and that was done by Prince Barnaulov, the well-known rich grandee, invested with special powers, the representative of the government. What is one to expect after that? The whole frail person of Madame Suhanchikov was shaking with indignation. Spasms passed over her face, her withered bosom was heaving convulsively under her flat corset. Of her eyes it is needless to speak. They were fairly leaping out of her head. But then they were always leaping, whatever she might be talking about. "'A crying shame! A crying shame!' cried Bombeyev. "'No punishment could be bad enough.' "'Hm! Hm! From top to bottom it's all rotten,' observed Gubaryov, without raising his voice, however. "'In that case punishment is not... that needs other measures.' "'But is it really true?' commented Litvinov. "'Is it true?' broke in Madame Suhanchikov. "'Why, that one can't even dream of doubting, can't even d-d-dream of it!' She pronounced these words with such energy that she was fairly shaking with the effort. "'I was told of that by a very trustworthy man, and you, Stepan Nikolaitch, know him. Elistratov, Kapitan. He heard it himself from eyewitnesses, spectators of this disgraceful scene. "'What Elistratov?' inquired Gubaryov. "'The one who was in Kazan?' "'Yes, I know. Stepan Nikolaitch. A rumour was spread about him that he took bribes there from some contractors or distillers. But then, who is it says so? Pelikanov. And how can one believe Pelikanov, when every one knows he is simply a spy? No, with your permission, Matrona Semyonovna, interposed Bombeyev. I am friends with Pelikanov. He is not a spy at all. Yes, yes, that's just what he is, a spy. But wait a minute, kindly... A spy, a spy! shrieked Madame Suhanchikov. "'No, no, one minute! I tell you what!' shrieked Bombeyev in his turn. "'A spy, a spy!' persisted Madame Suhanchikov. "'No, no! There's Tentelyev now! That's a different matter!' roared Bombeyev, with all the force of his lungs. Madame Suhanchikov was silent for a moment. "'I know for a fact about that gentleman,' he continued in his ordinary voice, that when he was summoned before the secret police he grovelled at the feet of the Countess Blasenkrampf, and kept whining, "'Save me! Intercede for me!' But Pelikanov never demeaned himself to baseness like that. "'Hm, Tentelyev,' muttered Gubaryov, "'that, that ought to be noted.' Madame Suhanchikov shrugged her shoulders contemptuously. "'They're one worse than another,' she said. "'But I know a still better story about Tentelyev. He was, as every one knows, a most horrible despot with his serfs, though he gave himself out for an emancipator. Well, he was once at some friend's house in Paris, and suddenly in comes Madame Beecher Stowe. You know, Uncle Tom's cabin. Tentelyev who's an awfully pushy fellow, began asking the host to present him, but directly she heard his name. What? she said. He presumes to be introduced to the author of Uncle Tom? And she gave him a slap on the cheek. Go away, she says, at once. And what do you think? Tentelyev took his hat and slunk away, pretty crestfallen. Come, I think that's exaggerated observed Bombeyev. Go away, she certainly did say. That's a fact. But she didn't give him a smack. She did, she did, repeated Madame Suhanchikov, with convulsive intensity. I am not talking idle gossip. And you are friends with men like that? Excuse me, excuse me, Matrona Semyonovna. I never spoke of Tentelyev as a friend of mine. I was speaking of Pelikanov. Well, if it's not Tintelyev, it's another. Michnyov, for example. What did he do, then? asked Bombeyev, already showing signs of alarm. What? Is it possible you don't know? He exclaimed on the Poznesensky prospect, 
in the hearing of all the world that all the liberals ought to be in prison and what's more an old schoolfellow came to him a poor man of course and said can i come to dinner with you and this was his answer no impossible i have two counts dining with me to-day get along with you but that's slander upon my word vociferated bombeyev slander slander in the first place prince vahrushkin who was also dining at your michnyov's prince vahrushkin gorbayev interpolated severely is my cousin but i don't allow him to enter my house so there is no need to mention him even in the second place continued madame suhanchikov with a submissive nod in gurbayev's direction prashkovya yakolovna told me so herself you have hit on a fine authority to quote why she and sarakizov are the greatest scandal-mongers going i beg your pardon sarkizov is a liar certainly he filched the very pall of brocade off his dead father's coffin i will never dispute that but praskovna yakovlovna there's no comparison remember how magnanimously she parted from her husband but you i know are always ready come enough enough matrovna semyonovna said bombeyev interrupting her let us give up this tittle-tattle and take a loftier flight i am not new to the work you know have you read mademoiselle de la quintini that's something charming now and quite in accord with your principles at the same time i never read novels now was madame suhanchikov's dry and sharp reply why because i have not the time now i have no thoughts now but for one thing sewing machines what machines inquired litvinov sewing sewing all women ought to provide themselves with sewing machines and form societies in that way they will all be enabled to earn their living and will become independent at once in no other way can they ever be emancipated that is an important most important social question i had such an argument about it with boleslav stadnitsky boleslav stadnitsky is a marvellous nature but he looks at these things in an awfully frivolous spirit he does nothing but laugh idiot all will in their due time be called to account from all it will be exacted pronounced gurbayev deliberately in a tone half professorial half prophetic yes yes repeated bombeyev it will be exacted precisely so it will be exacted but stepan nikolaitch he added dropping his voice how goes the great work i am collecting materials replied gubaryov knitting his brows and turning to litvinov whose head began to swim from the medley of unfamiliar names and the frenzy of backbiting he asked him what subjects he was interested in litvinov satisfied his curiosity ah to be sure the natural sciences that is useful as training as training not as an end in itself the end at present should be mm, should be different allow me to ask what views do you hold what views yes that is more accurately speaking what are your political views litvinov smiled strictly speaking i have no political views the broad-shouldered man sitting in the corner raised his head quickly at these words and looked attentively at litvinov how is that observed gubaryov with peculiar gentleness have you not yet reflected on the subject or have you grown weary of it how shall i say it seems to me that for us russians it is too early yet to have political views or to imagine that we have them observe that i attribute to the word political the meaning which belongs to it by right and that aha he belongs to the undeveloped gurbaryov interrupted him with the same gentleness and going up to voroshilov he asked him had he read the pamphlet he had given him voroshilov to litvinov's astonishment had not uttered a word ever since his entrance but had only knitted his brows and rolled his eyes 
as a rule he was either speechifying or else perfectly dumb he now expanded his chest in soldierly fashion and with a tap of his heels nodded assent well and how was it did you like it as regards the fundamental principles i liked it but i did not agree with the inferences hmm andrei ivanitch praised that pamphlet however you must expand your doubts to me later you desire it in writing gurbaryov was obviously surprised he had not expected this however after a moment's thought he replied yes in writing by the way i will ask you to explain me your views also in regard to in regard to associations associations on la salle system do you desire or on the system of schules et delitch hmm on both for us russians you understand the financial aspect of the matter is specially important yes and the artel as the germ all that must one take note of one must go deeply into it and the question too of the land to be apportioned to the peasants and you stepan nikolaitch what is your view as to the number of acres suitable inquired voroshilov with reverential delicacy in his voice hmm and the commune articulated gubaryov deep in thought and biting a tuft of his beard he stared at the table leg the commune do you understand that is a grand word then what is the significance of these conflagrations these these government measures against sunday schools reading rooms journals and the refusal of the peasants to sign the charters regulating their position in the future and finally what of what is happening in poland don't you see hmm, that we we have to unite with the people find out find out their views suddenly a heavy almost a wrathful emotion seemed to take possession of gubaryov he even grew black in the face and breathed heavily but still did not raise his eyes and continued to gnaw at his beard can't you see yevseyev is a wretch madame suhantchikov burst out noisily all of a sudden bambeyev had been relating something to her in a voice lowered out of respect for their host gubaryov turned round swiftly on his heels and again began limping about the room fresh guests began to arrive towards the end of the evening a good many people were assembled among them came too mr yevseyev whom madame suhantchikov had vilified so cruelly she entered into conversation with him very cordially and asked him to escort her home there arrived too a certain pishchalkin an ideal mediator one of those men of precisely whom perhaps russia stands in need a man that is narrow of little information and no great gifts but conscientious patient and honest the peasants of his district almost worshipped him and he regarded himself very respectfully as a creature genuinely deserving of esteem a few officers too were there escaped for a brief furlough to europe and rejoicing though of course warily and ever mindful of their colonel in the background of their brains in the opportunity of dallying a little with intellectual even rather dangerous people two lanky students from heidelberg came hurrying in one looked about him very contemptuously the other giggled spasmodically both were very ill at ease after them a frenchman a so-called petit jeune homme poked his nose in a nasty silly pitiful little creature who enjoyed some repute among his fellow commis voyageurs on the theory that russian countesses had fallen in love with him for his own part his reflections were centred more upon getting a supper gratis the last to appear was tit bindasov in appearance a rollicking german student in reality a skinflint in words a terrorist by vocation a police officer a friend of russian merchants wives and parisian cocottes bald toothless and drunken he arrived very red and sodden affirming that he had lost his last farthing to that blackguard benezet in reality he had won sixteen guldens 
In short, there were a number of people. Remarkable, really remarkable, was the respect with which all these people treated Gubaryov as a preceptor or chief. They laid their ideas before him, and submitted them to his judgment, and he replied by muttering, plucking at his beard, averting his eyes, or by some disconnected, meaningless words, which were at once seized upon as the utterances of the loftiest wisdom. Gubaryov himself seldom interposed in the discussions. But the others strained their lungs to the utmost to make up for it. It happened more than once that three or four were shouting for ten minutes together, and all were content and understood. The conversation lasted till after midnight, and was as usual distinguished by the number and variety of the subjects discussed. Madame Suhanchikov talked about Garibaldi, about a certain Karl Ivanovitch, who had been flogged by the serfs of his own household, about Napoleon the Third, about women's work, about a merchant, Pleskachov, who had designedly caused the death of twelve workwomen, and had received a medal for it, with the inscription, For Public Services, about the proletariat, about the Georgian prince Chuk Chudulizov, who had shot his wife with a cannon, and about the future of Russia. Pishchalkin, too, talked of the future of Russia, and of the spirit monopoly, and of the significance of nationalities, and of how he hated above everything what was vulgar. There was an outburst all of a sudden from Voroshilov. In a single breath, almost choking himself, he mentioned Draper, Vircho, Shelgunov, Bichot, Helmholtz, Starr, St. Raymond, Johann Müller the physiologist and Johann Müller the historian, obviously confounding them, Taine, Renan, Schiapov, and then Thomas Nash, Peel, Green. What sort of queer fish may they be? Bombeyev muttered, bewildered, Shakespeare's predecessors having the same relation to him as the ranges of the Alps to Mont Blanc. Voroshilov replied cuttingly, and he, too, touched on the future of Russia. Bombeyev also spoke of the future of Russia, and even depicted it in glowing colours. But he was thrown into special raptures over the thought of Russian music, in which he saw something. Ah, great indeed! And in confirmation he began humming a song of Barlamov's, but was soon interrupted by a general shout. He is singing the Miserere from the Trovatore, and singing it excruciatingly, too. One little officer was reviling Russian literature in the midst of the hubbub. Another was quoting verses from Sparks. But Tit Bindasov went even further. He declared that all these swindlers ought to have their teeth knocked out. And that's all about it. But he did not particularize who were the swindlers alluded to. The smoke from the cigars became stifling. All were hot and exhausted, every one was hoarse, all eyes were growing dim, and the perspiration stood out in drops on every face. Bottles of iced beer were brought in, and drunk off instantaneously. "'What was I saying?' remarked one, and "'With whom was I disputing, and about what?' inquired another. And among all the uproar and the smoke, Gubardyov walked indefatigably up and down as before swaying from side to side, and twitching at his beard. Now listening, turning an ear to some controversy, now putting in a word of his own. And every one was forced to feel that he, Gubaryov, was the source of it all, that he was the master here, and the most eminent personality. Litvinov, towards ten o'clock, began to have a terrible headache, and, taking advantage of a louder outburst of general excitement, went off quietly unobserved. Madame Suhanchikov had recollected a fresh act of injustice of Prince Barnaulov. He had all but given orders to have someone's ears bitten off. The fresh night air enfolded Litvinov's flushed face caressingly. The fragrant breeze breathed on his parched lips. What is it, he thought as he went along the dark avenue, that I have been present at? Why were they met together? What were they shouting, scolding, and making such a bother about? What was it all for? 
Litvinov shrugged his shoulders, and, turning into Weber's, he picked up a newspaper and asked for an ice. The newspaper was taken up with a discussion on the Roman question, and the ice turned out to be very nasty. He was already preparing to go home, when suddenly an unknown person in a wide-brimmed hat drew near, and, saying in Russian, "'I hope I am not in your way,' sat down at his table. Only then, after a closer glance at the stranger, Litvinov recognized him as the broad-shouldered gentleman hidden away in a corner at Gubaryov's, who had stared at him with such attention when the conversation had turned on political views. During the whole evening this gentleman had not once opened his mouth, and now, sitting down near Litvinov and taking off his hat, he looked at him with an expression of friendliness and some embarrassment. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Gubaryov, at whose rooms I had the pleasure of meeting you today, he began, did not introduce me to you, so that, with your leave, I will now introduce myself, Potugin, retired councillor. I was in the Department of Finances in St. Petersburg. I hope you do not think it strange. I am not in the habit, as a rule, of making friends so abruptly, but with you... Potugin grew rather mixed, and he asked the waiter to bring him a little glass of Kirschwasser. To give me courage, he said, with a smile. Litvinov looked with redoubled interest at the last of all the new persons with whom it had been his lot to be brought into contact that day. His thought was at once, he is not the same as those. Certainly he was not. There sat before him, drumming with delicate fingers on the edge of the table, a broad-shouldered man, with an ample frame on short legs, a downcast head of curly hair, with very intelligent and very mournful eyes under bushy brows, a thick well-cut mouth, bad teeth, and that purely Russian nose to which is assigned the epithet potato a man of awkward, even odd, exterior. At least he was certainly not of a common type. He was carelessly dressed, his old-fashioned coat hung on him like a sack, and his cravat was twisted awry. His sudden friendliness, far from striking Litvinov as intrusive, secretly flattered him. It was impossible not to see that it was not a common practice with this man to attach himself to strangers he made a curious impression on Litvinov. He awakened in him respect and liking, and a kind of involuntary compassion. "'I am not in your way, then?' he repeated, in a soft, rather languid and faint voice, which was marvellously in keeping with his whole personality. "'No, indeed,' replied Litvinov. "'Quite the contrary. I am very glad.' "'Really? Well, then, I am glad, too.' I have heard a great deal about you. I know what you are engaged in and what your plans are. It's a good work. That's why you were silent this evening." "'Yes, you too said very little, I fancy,' observed Litvinov. Potugin sighed. The others said enough and to spare. I listened. Well, he added, after a moment's pause, raising his eyebrows with a rather humorous expression, did you like our building of the Tower of Babel? That's just what it was. You have expressed it capitally. I kept wanting to ask those gentlemen what they were in such a fuss about." Potugin sighed again. That's the whole point of it, that they don't know that themselves. In former days the expression used about them would have been, they are the blind instruments of higher ends. Well, nowadays we make use of sharper epithets and take note that I am not in the least intending to blame them. I will say more. They are all, that is, almost all, excellent people. Of Madame Suhanchikov, for instance. I know for certain much that is good. She gave away the last of her fortune to two poor nieces. Even admitting that the desire of doing something picturesque, of showing herself off, was not without its influence on her, 
Still, you will agree that it was a remarkable act of self-sacrifice in a woman not herself well off. Of Mr. Pishtalkin there is no need to speak, even. The peasants of his district will certainly in time present him with a silver bowl like a pumpkin, and perhaps even a holy picture representing his patron saint, and though he will tell them in his speech of thanks that he does not deserve such an honour, he won't tell the truth there. He does deserve it. Mr. Bombeyev, your friend, has a wonderfully good heart. It's true that it's with him as with the poet Yazikov, who, they say, used to sing the praises of Bakik revelry, sitting over a book and sipping water. His enthusiasm is completely without a special object, still it is enthusiasm. And Mr. Voroshilov, too, is the most good-natured fellow. Like all his sort, all men who've taken the first prizes at school, he's an aide-de-camp of the sciences, and he even holds his tongue sententiously, but then he is so young. Yes, yes, they are all excellent people, and when you come to results there's nothing to show for it. The ingredients are all first-rate, but the dish is not worth eating. Litvinov listened to Potugin with growing astonishment. Every phrase, every turn of his slow but self-confident speech, betrayed both the power of speaking and the desire to speak. Potugin did, in fact, like speaking, and could speak well, but as a man in whom life had succeeded in wearing away vanity, he waited with philosophic calm for a good opportunity, a meeting with a kindred spirit. "'Yes, yes,' he began again, with the special dejected but not peevish humour peculiar to him, "'it is all very strange. There is something else I want you to note. Let a dozen Englishmen, for example, come together, and they will at once begin to talk of the submarine telegraph, or the tax on paper, or a method of tanning rat-skins, or something, that's to say, practical and definite. A dozen Germans, and of course Schleswig-Holstein, and the unity of Germany, will be brought on the scene. Given a dozen Frenchmen, and the conversation will infallibly turn upon amorous adventures, however much you try to divert them from the subject, but let a dozen Russians meet together, and instantly there springs up the question, you had an opportunity of being convinced of the fact this evening, the question of the significance and the future of Russia. And in terms so general, beginning with creation, without facts or conclusions, they worry and worry away at that unlucky subject, as children chew away at a bit of India rubber, neither for pleasure nor profit, as the saying is. Well, then, of course the rotten West comes in for its share. It's a curious thing, it beats us at every point, this West, but yet we declare that it's rotten. And if only we had a genuine contempt for it, pursued Potugin. But that's really all cant and humbug. We can do well enough as far as abuse goes, but the opinion of the West is the only thing we value, the opinion, that's to say, of the Parisian loafers. I know a man, a good fellow, I fancy, the father of a family, and no longer young. He was thrown into deep dejection for some days, because in a Parisian restaurant he had asked for une portion de biftec aux pommes de terre, and a real Frenchman thereupon shouted, Garçon, biftec pomme! My friend was ready to die with shame, and after that he shouted everywhere, Biftec pomme! and taught others to do the same. The very cocottes are surprised at the reverential trepidation with which our young barbarians enter their shameful drawing-rooms. Good God, they are thinking, is this really where I am, with no less a person than Anna de Leon herself? Tell me, pray, continued Litvinov, to what do you ascribe the influence Gubaryov undoubtedly has over all about him? Is it his talent, his abilities? No, no, there is nothing of that sort about him. His personal character, is it, then? Not that, either, but he has a strong will. We Slavs, for the most part, as we all know, are badly off for that commodity, and we grovel before it. It is Mr. Gubaryov's will to be a ruler, and every one has recognized him as a ruler. What would you have, 
the government has freed us from the dependence of serfdom and many thanks to it but the habits of slavery are too deeply ingrained in us we cannot easily be rid of them we want a master in everything and everywhere as a rule this master is a living person sometimes it is some so-called tendency which gains authority over us at present for instance we are all bond slaves of natural science why owing to what causes we take this bondage upon us that is a difficult matter to see into but such seemingly is our nature but the great thing is that we should have a master well here he is among us that means he is ours and we can afford to despise everything else simply slaves and our pride is slavish and slavish too is our humility if a new master arises it's all over with the old one then it was yakov and now it is Sidor. we box yakov's ears and kneel to Sidor. come to mind how many tricks of that sort have been played amongst us we talk of scepticism as our special characteristic but even in our scepticism we are not like a free man fighting with a sword but like a lackey hitting out with his fist and very likely he is doing even that at his master's bidding then we are a soft people too it's not difficult to keep the curb on us so that's the way mr gubaryov has become a power among us he has chipped and chipped away at one point till he has chipped himself into success people see that he is a man who has a great opinion of himself who believes in himself and commands that's the great thing that he can command it follows that he must be right and we ought to obey him all our sects our onophrists and akulinists were founded exactly in that way he who holds the rod is the corporal potugin's cheeks were flushed and his eyes grew dim but strange to say his speech cruel and even malicious as it was had no touch of bitterness but rather of sorrow genuine and sincere sorrow how did you come to know gubaryov asked litvinov i have known him a long while and observe another peculiarity among us a certain writer for example spent his whole life in inveighing in prose and verse against drunkenness and attacking the system of the drink monopoly and lo and behold he went and bought two spirit distilleries and opened a hundred drink shops and it made no difference any other man might have been wiped off the face of the earth but he was not even reproached for it and here is mr gubaryov he is a slavophile and a democrat and a socialist and anything you like but his property has been and is still managed by his brother a master of the old style one of those who were famous for their fists and the very madame suhanchikov who makes mrs beecher stowe box tentelyev's ears is positively in the dust before gubaryov's feet and you know the only thing he has to back him is that he reads clever books and always gets at the pith of them you could see for yourself to-day what sort of gift he has for expression and thank god too that he does talk little and keeps in his shell for when he is in good spirits and lets himself go then it's more than even i patient as i am can stand he begins by coarse joking and telling filthy anecdotes yes really our majestic mr gubaryov tells filthy anecdotes and guffaws so revoltingly over them all the time are you so patient observed litvinov i should have supposed the contrary but let me ask your name and your father's name potugin sipped a little kirschwasser my name is sozont sozont ivanitch they gave me that magnificent name in honour of a kinsman an archimandrite to whom i am indebted for nothing else i am if i may venture so to express myself of most reverend stock and as for your doubts about my patience they are quite groundless i am very patient i served for twenty-two years under the authority of my own uncle an actual councillor of state irinya potugin you don't know him no i congratulate you no i am patient but let us return to our first head as my esteemed colleague 
who was burned alive some centuries ago, the proto-pope of Akum, used to say. I am amazed, my dear sir, at my fellow countrymen. They are all depressed, they all walk with downcast heads, and at the same time they are all filled with hope, and on the smallest excuse they lose their heads and fly off into ecstasies. Look at the Slavophiles, even, among whom Mr. Gubaryov reckons himself. They are most excellent people, but there is the same mixture of despair and exultation. They too live in the future tense. Everything will be, will be, if you please. In reality there is nothing done, and Russia for ten whole centuries has created nothing of its own, either in government, in law, in science, in art, or even in handicraft. But wait a little, have patience, it is all coming. And why is it coming? Give us leave to inquire. Why, because we, to be sure, the cultured classes, are all worthless. But the people, ah, the great people, you see that peasant smock, that is the source that everything is to come from. All the other idols have broken down. Let us have faith in the smock frock. Well, but suppose the smock frock fails us. No, it will not fail. Read Kohanovsky, and cast your eyes up to heaven. Really, if I were a painter, I would paint a picture of this sort. A cultivated man standing before a peasant, doing him homage. Heal me, dear master peasant, I am perishing of disease, and a peasant doing homage in his turn to the cultivated man. Teach me, dear master gentleman, I am perishing from ignorance. Well, and of course both are standing still. But what we ought to do is to feel really humble for a little, not only in words, and to borrow from our elder brothers what they have invented already before us, and better than us. Waiter, noch ein Glacian Kirsch. You mustn't think I'm a drunkard, but alcohol loosens my tongue. After what you have just said, observed Litvinov with a smile, I need not even inquire to which party you belong, and what is your opinion about Europe. But let me make one observation to you. You say that we ought to borrow from our elder brothers, but how can we borrow without consideration of the conditions of climate and of soil, the local and national peculiarities? My father, I recollect, ordered from Butinov a cast-iron thrashing machine, highly recommended. The machine was very good, certainly, but what happened? For five long years it remained useless in the barn, till it was replaced by a wooden American one, far more suitable to our ways and habits, as the American machines are, as a rule. One cannot borrow at random, Sozont Ivanitch. Potugin lifted his head. I did not expect such a criticism as that from you, excellent Grigory Mihailovitch, he began, after a moment's pause. Who wants to make you borrow at random? Of course you steal what belongs to another man, not because it is someone else's, but because it suits you. So it follows that you consider, you make a selection. And as for results, pray don't let us be unjust to ourselves. There will be originality enough in them by virtue of those very local, climatic, and other conditions which you mention. Only lay good food before it, and the natural stomach will digest it in its own way. And in time, as the organism gains in vigour, it will give it a sauce of its own. Take our language even as an instance. Peter the Great deluged it with thousands of foreign words, Dutch, French, and German. Those words expressed ideas with which the Russian people had to be familiarized. Without scruple or ceremony, Peter poured them wholesale by bucketsful into us. At first, of course, the result was something of a monstrous product. But later there began precisely that process of digestion to which I have alluded. The ideas have been introduced and assimilated. The foreign forms evaporated gradually, and the language found substitutes for them from within itself. And now your humble servant, the most mediocre stylist, will undertake to translate any page you like out of Hegel. Yes, indeed, out of Hegel, without making use of a single word not Slavonic. What has happened with the language, one must hope, will happen in other departments. It all turns on the question, 
is it a nature of strong vitality and our nature well it will stand the test it has gone through greater trials than that only nations in a state of nervous debility feeble nations need fear for their health and their independence just as it is only weak-minded people who are capable of falling into triumphant rhapsodies over the fact that we are russians i am very careful over my health but i don't go into ecstasies over it i should be ashamed that is all very true sozont ivanitch observed litvinov in his turn but why inevitably expose ourselves to such tests you say yourself that at first the result was monstrous well what if that monstrous product had persisted indeed it has persisted as you know yourself only not in the language and that means a great deal it is our people not i who have done it i am not to blame because they are destined to go through a discipline of this kind the germans have developed in a normal way cry the slavophiles let us too have a normal development but how are you to get it when the very first historical step taken by our race the summoning of a prince from over the sea to rule over them is an irregularity an abnormality which is repeated in every one of us down to the present day each of us at least once in his life has certainly said to something foreign not russian come rule and reign over me i am ready of course to agree that when we put a foreign substance into our own body we cannot tell for certain what it is we are putting there bread or poison yet it is a well-known thing that you can never get from bad to good through what is better but always through a worse state of transition and poison too is useful in medicine it is only fit for fools or knaves to point with triumph to the poverty of the peasants after the emancipation and the increase of drunkenness since the abolition of the farming of the spirit tax through worse to better potugin passed his hand over his face you asked me what was my opinion of europe he began again i admire her and am devoted to her principles to the last degree and don't in the least think it necessary to conceal the fact i have long no not long for some time ceased to be afraid to give full expression to my convictions and i saw that you too had no hesitation in informing mr gubaryov of your way of thinking thank god i have given up paying attention to the ideas and points of view and habits of the man i am conversing with really i know of nothing worse than that quite superfluous cowardice that cringing desire to be agreeable by virtue of which you may see an important dignitary among us trying to ingratiate himself with some little student who is quite insignificant in his eyes positively playing down to him with all sorts of tricks and devices even if we admit that the dignitary may do it out of desire for popularity what induces us common folk to shuffle and degrade ourselves yes yes i am a westerner i am devoted to europe that's to say speaking more accurately i am devoted to culture the culture at which they make fun so wittily among us just now and to civilization yes yes that is a better word and i love it with my whole heart and believe in it and i have no other belief and never shall have that word civilization potugin pronounced each syllable with full stress and emphasis is intelligible and pure and holy and all the other ideals nationality glory or what you like they smell of blood away with them well but russia sozont ivanitch your country you love it potugin passed his hand over his face i love her passionately and passionately hate her litvinov shrugged his shoulders that's stale sozont ivanitch that's a commonplace and what of it so that's what you're afraid of a commonplace i know many excellent commonplaces here for example law and liberty is a well-known commonplace why do you consider it's better as it is with us lawlessness and bureaucratic tyranny and besides all those phrases by which so many young heads are turned vile bourgeoisie souveraineté du peuple 
right to labour aren't they commonplaces too and as for love inseparable from hate byronism interposed litvinov the romanticism of the thirties excuse me you're mistaken such a mingling of emotions was first mentioned by catullus the roman poet catullus two thousand years ago i have read that for i know a little latin thanks to my clerical origin if so i may venture to express myself yes indeed i both love and hate my russia my strange sweet nasty precious country i have left her just now i want a little fresh air after sitting for twenty years on a clerk's high stool in a government office i have left russia and i am happy and contented here but i shall soon go back again i feel that it's a beautiful land of gardens but our wild berries will not grow here you are happy and contented and i too like the place said litvinov and i came here to study but that does not prevent me from seeing things like that he pointed to two cocottes who passed by attended by a little group of members of the jockey club grimacing and lisping and to the gambling saloon full to overflowing in spite of the lateness of the hour and who told you i am blind to that potugin broke in but pardon my saying it your remark reminds me of the triumphant allusions made by our unhappy journalists at the time of the crimean war to the defects in the english war department exposed in the times i am not an optimist myself and all humanity all our life all this comedy with tragic issues presents itself to me in no roseate colours but why fasten upon the west what is perhaps ingrained in our very human nature that gambling hall is disgusting certainly but is our home-bred card-sharping any lovelier think you no my dear grigory mihailovitch let us be more humble more retiring a good pupil sees his master's faults but he keeps a respectful silence about them these very faults are of use to him and set him on the right path but if nothing will satisfy you but sharpening your teeth on the unlucky west there goes prince coco at a gallop he will most likely lose in a quarter of an hour over the green table the hardly earned rent wrung from a hundred and fifty families his nerves are upset for i saw him at marx's to-day turning over a pamphlet of velo he will be a capital person for you to talk to but please please said litvinov hurriedly seeing that potugin was getting up from his place i know prince coco very little and besides of course i greatly prefer talking to you thanks very much potugin interrupted him getting up and making a bow but i have already had a good deal of conversation with you that's to say really i have talked alone and you have probably noticed yourself that a man is always as it were ashamed and awkward when he has done all the talking especially so on a first meeting as if to show what a fine fellow one is good-bye for the present and i repeat i am very glad to have made your acquaintance but wait a minute sozon ivanitch tell me at least where you live and whether you intend to remain here long potugin seemed a little put out i shall remain about a week in baden we can meet here though at weber's or at marx's or else i will come to you still i must know your address yes but you see i am not alone you are married asked litvinov suddenly no good heavens what an absurd idea but i have a girl with me oh articulated litvinov with a face of studied politeness as though he would ask pardon and he dropped his eyes she is only six years old pursued potugin she is an orphan the daughter of a lady a good friend of mine so we had better meet here good-bye he pulled his hat over his curly head and disappeared quickly twice there was a glimpse of him under the gas lamps in the rather meanly lighted road that leads into the lichtenthaler alley End of chapter five Chapter Six of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six. A strange man, thought Litvinov, as he turned into the hotel where he was staying. A strange man. I must see more of him. He went into his room. A letter on the table caught his eye. Ah, from Tanya, he thought, and was overjoyed at once. But the letter was from his country place, from his father. Litvinov broke the thick heraldic seal, and was just setting to work to read it, when he was struck by a strong, very agreeable, and familiar fragrance, and saw in the window a great bunch of fresh heliotrope in a glass of water. Litvinov bent over them, not without amazement, touched them, and smelt them. Something seemed to stir in his memory, something very remote, but what precisely he could not discover. He rang for the servant and asked him where these flowers had come from. The man replied that they had been brought by a lady who would not give her name, but said that Herr Slitvinov would be sure to guess who she was by the flowers. Again something stirred in Litvinov's memory. He asked the man what the lady looked like, and the servant informed him that she was tall and grandly dressed and had a veil over her face. A Russian countess, most likely he added. "'What makes you think that?' asked Litvinov. "'She gave me two guldens,' responded the servant with a grin. Litvinov dismissed him, and for a long while after he stood in deep thought before the window. At last, however, with a wave of his hand, he began again upon the letter from the country. His father poured out to him his usual complaints, asserting that no one would take their corn, even for nothing that the people had got quite out of all habits of obedience, and that probably the end of the world was coming soon. Fancy, he wrote, among other things, my last coachman, the Kalmuk boy, do you remember him, has been bewitched, and the fellow would certainly have died, and I should have had none to drive me, but, thank goodness, some kind folks suggested and advised to send the sick man to Ryazan to a priest, well known as a master against witchcraft, and his cure has actually succeeded as well as possible, in confirmation of which I lay before you the letter of the good father as a document. Litvinov ran through this document with curiosity. In it was set forth that the serving-man, Nikanur Dmitriev, was beset with a malady which could not be touched by the medical faculty, and this malady was the work of wicked people but he himself, Nikanor, was the cause of it, since he had not fulfilled his promise to a certain girl, and therefore, by the aid of others, she had made him unfit for anything, and if I had not appeared to aid him in these circumstances, he would surely have perished utterly, like a worm. But I, trusting in the all-seeing eye, have become a stay to him in his life, and how I accomplished it, that is a mystery. I beg your excellency not to countenance a girl who has such wicked arts, and even to chide her would be no harm, or she may again work him a mischief." Litvinov fell to musing over this document. It brought him a whiff of the desert, of the steppes, of the blind darkness of the life mouldering there, and it seemed a marvellous thing that he should be reading such a letter in Baden, of all places. Meanwhile it had long struck midnight. Litvinov went to bed and put out his light, but he could not get to sleep. The faces he had seen, the talk he had heard, kept coming back and revolving strangely interwoven and entangled in his burning head, which ached from the fumes of tobacco. Now he seemed to hear Gubaryov's muttering, and fancied his eyes with their dull, persistent stare fastened on the floor. Then suddenly those eyes began to glow and leap, and he recognized Madame Suhanchikov, and listened to her shrill voice, and involuntarily repeated after her in a whisper, She did, she did, slap his face. Then the clumsy figure of Potugin passed before him, and for the tenth and the twentieth time he went over every word he had uttered. Then, like a jack-in-the-box, Voroshilov jumped up in his trim coat, which fitted him like a new uniform, and Pishchalkin gravely and sagaciously nodded his well-cut and truly well-intentioned head. And then Bindasov bawled and swore, and Bombeyev fell into tearful transports, 
and above all this scent this persistent sweet heavy scent gave him no rest and drew more and more powerful in the darkness and more and more importunately it reminded him of something which still eluded his grasp the idea occurred to litvinov that the scent of flowers at night in a bedroom was injurious and he got up and groping his way to the nosegay carried it into the next room but even from there the oppressive fragrance penetrated to him on his pillow and under the counterpane and he tossed in misery from side to side a slight delirium had already begun to creep over him already the priest the master against witchcraft had twice run across his road in the guise of a very playful hare with a beard and a pigtail and voroshilov was trilling before him sitting in a huge general's plumed cock hat like a nightingale in a bush when suddenly he jumped up in bed and clasping his hands cried can it be she it can't be but to explain this exclamation of litvinov's we must beg the indulgent reader to go back a few years with us End of chapter six